Okay, so the comets, right? Some of them have the have very uh, high eccentricities and very large semi-major axes, originating probably from the Oort cloud until they're scattered into the Kuiper belt or into the inner solar system by the gravitational influence of the giant planets. But there are other objects in the Kuiper belt too, other than just comets. Uh, and so let's talk about those Kuiper belt objects, which I'm going to call here KBOs. So if we look at all of the Kuiper belt objects and add up the mass of all of the ones uh, that we think exist, then it gives us about four Plutos worth of total mass. That's only about 1% of Earth's total mass. So it's not a very considerable amount of material out here in the Kuiper belt, um, but there's you know uh, some comets, but also some dwarf planets there that make up that uh, total mass. Okay, but I wanna ask you another sort of review type question, which is how do we even know the mass of objects in the Kuiper belt? How can we measure the mass of such far away and unexplored objects? Okay, so I'm seeing mostly votes for D followed by C. So those are both reasonable ideas. So um, one way that we could maybe figure out their mass is if we knew both their volume and their density. And we could know the density of the objects out there fairly um, easily by knowing you know, their icy objects in the outer solar system. So their density can be assumed. Um, so the question is then, is it possible to infer their volume based on how much sunlight they reflect? And I, I think this is a difficult thing to do, but possible. Um, but the, um, the KBOs that have moons are extremely useful for figuring out their mass because we can use the orbital period of the moon to calculate the Kuiper Belt object's mass. And this is in the same way that we looked at long, long ago, how we can measure the mass of the sun based on the orbits of the planets. So let me just remind you briefly how this works. Um, going back to Kepler's third law here. And so um, as we know, Kepler's third law, we um, kind of shortcut to the period of an object squared is equal to its semi-major axis cubed. We've used that equation on from time to time. Um, but in actuality, it states that the period squared is equal to the mass of the parent body plus the mass of the satellite body times the semi-major axis of the satellite body cubed. Um, and so the reason that most of the time this simplifies to p squared equals a cubed is because the mass of the um, planets are very, very small compared to the mass of the sun. And so you can consider this mass negligible and then the entire equation is expressed in units such that the mass of the sun is equal to one. All right, um, but we can keep all of this complexity in the equation. Um, it's still true possibly that the moon is much smaller than the Kuiper belt object. So we can still simplify a bit here and get the mass of the Kuiper belt object by solving this equation using the period of the moon and the semi-major axis of the moon. Um, so solving that equation would give us this expression. And so it's just then a matter of studying the uh, motion of the moon in order to figure out the mass of the KBO. All right, so this has been done for a limited number of Kuiper Belt objects because not all of them have moons, of course. You know, it's hard to explore the objects in the Kuiper Belt because as we saw, it's hard enough to measure objects in the outer solar system, right? These are very far away. So it's hard to design spacecraft that are autonomous enough and can withstand the very cold temperatures and being so far from the, uh, from the sun and still have you know, the communications ability to send information back to Earth. So this is the farthest object that we've ever explored up close. Um, this is called Arakov and it's 6.6 .6 billion kilometers from Earth. So just again, to give you a sense of scale here, we're really far away. Um, and this is a really interesting object because we talked about asteroids and comets being some of the debris that's left over from the solar system's formation. And um, as we'll see next time, and we sort of talked about this before, those little bits of debris, those little um, planetesimals start to uh, join together gravitationally, they're attracted gravitationally, stick together 
And over time, that process of accretion produces um, planets, right? And so Arakoff is a really interesting example of kind of that process in action. So this is a contact binary. It kind of looks like a little snowman. I'm putting his carrot nose over here, his little top hat. Um, so it's two bodies that have come together under the influence of gravity until they just touch. And where they've touched, they've fused together, possibly because their icy crusts are able to sort of bond to each other, right? And so now it's what we call a contact binary. So this is a really cool object showing the process of accretion um, happening. So a nice piece of evidence um, kind of supporting what we think about the solar system formation model.